a message of mercy and hope. Go to the highways and edges. Go to the ends of the earth. Go for them, be my witness. Tell them to come on home. Tell them to Good morning and welcome to Life Point Church. Let's stand this morning as we sing and we celebrate our risen Savior.
surely it was through Since when is it possible to live a star Fridays disappoint, Sundays empty too. Since when has it possible to ever stop? Hey, good morning, church. How we doing? Happy Easter. Yeah. Amen. Y'all gonna have a seat. Um, just wanna just got a few short things for you this morning. Uh, my name is Will Collins, and um, I'm one of the Wave pastors here. It's our youth that we have here. But I just want to welcome you here to Life Point Church. Um, if this is your first time ever, if this is your first time in a long time, um, just want to welcome you here and everybody that's normally with us. Um, happy Easter and welcome. Um, again, but we have a Connect Center in the back. Um, there'll be some people back there. If if you just want more information about who we are, if you want more information about what you have heard today about this resurrected Jesus that took your place and a death that you deserve, um, then we want to invite you back there to talk to us. Um, you can talk to Taylor um, after the service. But 
I really just want to welcome you here. And uh, one of the things that we've been talking about in teaching team, um, Taylor actually walked in on uh, Friday morning. And um, we are here in the States where we live. We're seven hours behind Jerusalem. And so he walked in at 9 a.m. in the morning on Friday. And he said, well, Jesus was just crucified. Um, Because it was believed to be about three in the afternoon. And and that really kind of sparked this, like, interest in my mind this week and this weekend to, you know, kind of kind of fill out what, like, about what time things happen. And so one of the things I thought about after he um, he said that that morning was, you know, what what was it like for, for Mary to sit there and watch her son be beaten and crucified on a cross? What was it like for the disciples to sit there and watch the guy that they followed so faithfully be beaten and hung on a cross. What was it like for when he cried, it is finished? When the ground shake, the veil of the temple was torn, what was it like to be there? What was it like on Saturday when they woke up and their promised Messiah was still dead? He was still in the grave. Where was their hope? What was it like on Friday when when both Marys sat at the tomb after Joseph of Arimathea went to Pilate and got Jesus' body and prepared him for burial and he put him in his own tomb and both Marys sat outside of that tomb according to Matthew's gospel and watched the tomb be closed? And then what was it like when those same Marys this morning started walking to that tomb expecting to see a stone still covering that tomb? a savior still in that grave when they're wondering how are we going to get this open how are we going to going to bring the spices and and do all this stuff that we need to do how how are we going to do this and then what was it like for them to get there and see the tomb the tomb empty and the stone rolled away cuz that happened that's true when they got there that stone was rolled away and Matthew's gospel tells us that that Mary, she was so distraught and she saw the gardener and said, where is my savior? What have you done with him? Where have you put him? And the gardener, who was Jesus, just simply said her name, Mary. And she instantly realized that it was Jesus standing in front of her. Do you know this morning that we serve and we worship a living savior? a Savior that calls each and every one of us by name this morning. And so this morning as we come in here, I want us to worship God like He is our risen Savior. I want us to to worship Him like the, the stone that was in front of that tomb when they watched it closed on Friday is open and is still open today. I want us to worship like Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father this morning because He is. Don't just let this be a Sunday that you come in and and you expect to just come in and get a little message and go home and eat and spend time with your family. Yes, that's the, all those things are great. But if we just shrug off right now, if we shrug off the opportunity we have to go before the throne of the Savior that took our place and died a death that we deserved, we are completely missing the purpose of today. So as we go into this time of worship, I want us to worship like we serve a living God because we do. Someone pray for us. Let's get back to worship. Noah, just thank you so much for all that you do. Thank you for your grace and your mercy. Thank you for your love. Thank you for how you took our place and died a death that we deserve on a cross. But not only did you die that death, Lord, that you picked your life back up and you resurrected. And that is what sets this religion, whatever you want to call this relationship apart from every other religion in the world, is that we get to serve a living God. We get to serve not only a living God, but a God that promises us that he is coming back again one day. So God, this morning, I pray that you just give us the strength and courage to worship you like you are that living God. Lord, we know that you are, but help us to worship you like you are. Help us to worship you like we are seated 
and kneeling in front of the throne in heaven right now. And we are singing with the angels, holy, holy, holy. Lord, help us to worship you that way, the worship that you deserve. And Lord, we love you and thank you. It's in your prayer, let me pray. Amen. Can we stand together, everyone?
to the Lamb And all who've gone before us And all who will believe Will sing the song of ages to the Lamb Cause your name is the highest And your name is the greatest Your name stands above them all Above all thrones and dominions and all powers and positions, your name stands above them all. And the angels cry, Holy, all creation cries, Holy, you are living.
We thank you for this opportunity, Lord. Thankful for the opportunity just to gather together and worship you because you are alive, you are risen. Oh, and that is everything. Your resurrection is everything. So God, as we open your word and we try, we try our very best to get our mind around the majesty of what that means. God, I pray that you get every drop of glory this morning. God, don't let this just be a morning where we dress up in our pretty pastels and we take our pictures and we come to church and then we leave and it doesn't actually change us. This day is everything. It changes everything if it's true. God, show us this morning. Teach us. In Jesus' name, amen. You guys can have a seat. Amen. Happy Easter. Easter. It is good to see you. My name is Taylor. I'm one of the teaching pastors here at the church. So glad that you're here this morning on a very, very, very special day. If you have your Bible, uh, I'll invite you to join me in Mark chapter 16. Mark chapter 16. If you don't know where that is or if you don't have a Bible with you, you can grab one of those sitting in front of you. We'll also have it on the screen this morning. Um, Today, if you haven't figured it out already, is a special day for us church. Amen? Amen. Today is a special day for us, for us because today is the day that Jesus rose from the dead. And as followers of Jesus, as Christians, this event is the foundation for all of our lives, right? This is, this is the foundation for our entire life. And here's the thing. If you don't have a firm foundation to build upon, it can be pretty tragic, right? I was reminded of this pretty vividly a couple of weeks ago. Uh, My in-laws watched the boys for us for a little bit. So me and my wife, Kelsey, we could go uh, eat dinner. We were coming back to pick them up, got them in the car. We're on our way home, and I hear something in the car going, da-doom, 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 da-doom. And I pull over, thinking, man, that's weird. Pull over, I look at all the tires, everything's fine, like I don't see anything. I'm thinking, man, maybe it's just these South Carolina roads. Like maybe, maybe it's just the bumps in the roads, I don't know. Get back in the car, same thing. Da-doom, da-doom, da-doom. All of a sudden, I hear this, doom. And about two seconds later, my tire sensor started going, ding, 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 ding. I pull over in this gravel parking lot, and sure enough, man, that passenger tire is just flat. Now, I don't know what it is. That is like our unlucky thing. Like I think every family has like their thing that just, they just, they're unlucky with it. Like tires are our unlucky thing. I have changed more tires in the last eight years than I think I've changed, than probably any of you have ever changed in your life combined. That's what it feels like to me. I bought new tires. I've replaced tires. I've changed flat tires. Like our donut has gotten some play in time, all right? And so I pull over and I start going to work. My my father-in-law, he comes and picks up Kelsey and the boys. He takes them on on home because it was dark and they needed to get uh, in the bath and get in the bed. And so I'm out there, man, in the dark. I'm trying to change this tire on the side of the road. I get the car lifted up, and as soon as I go to take that tire off, I realize I made a mistake because I was in that gravel parking lot, and I forgot to make sure that I had brushed away that loose gravel to make sure I put that tire jack on a strong, solid ground. And so as soon as I grabbed that tire, what happened? That Ford Explorer came down with every bit of weight that it had. I am so lucky that I'm not still under that Ford Explorer right now. Because I was like, I was right there underneath it. My phone wasn't, wasn't near, like I, I, I was in trouble, right? And so sure enough, as soon as, as soon as I like revived my heart from like, you know, being half dead after that, like scary, I brushed that gravel away. I made sure that it was on a strong foundation before I even tried to do anything else. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is that firm foundation for us, church. 
It is that firm foundation that we need to build our life on. The Bible is explicitly clear, man. If this resurrection isn't true, we're in trouble. Paul says that himself in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. He says, and if Christ has not been raised, your faith, Christian, is worthless. If Jesus isn't alive today, you're in trouble. You are still in your sin. Those then who have fallen asleep in Christ, those who have believed in him and they've already passed on, they also have perished. If we have put our hope in Christ for this life only, we should be pitied more than anyone. If the resurrection of Jesus isn't true, we're in trouble. But if it is, it changes everything. And so today as we look at this event... I have two goals, two questions that I hope to answer. Number one, why did Jesus rise from the dead? It's one thing to hear about a man who says, or hear in this word that says that this man came back to life, but why does that matter? Why did Jesus rise from the dead? And what does it mean for you? So look with me, Mark chapter 16, verse one. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome brought spices so that they could go and anoint him. Very early in the morning on the first day of the week, they went to the tomb at sunrise. Now, Paul's right here really quickly. Mark wrote this gospel, wrote this story, this account about 20 to 30 years after the life of Jesus. We believe that Mark was the scribe of Peter, that he took notes for Peter. So Mark's gospel, in all likelihood, is Peter's gospel. It's Peter's version of this story. And here's the thing. At this point, 20 to 30 years later, Mark had already heard all the the things that people would say to try to discredit the resurrection, right? He'd already heard all the things like people would say, hey, you know what? Maybe Jesus didn't die on the cross. Maybe he passed out. They put him in that tomb, and after three days, he started feeling a little bit better, you know, so much better that he popped, he rolled a massive stone away, and then fought off trained Roman soldiers, and then he walked away on his merry way. Like, that's one thing that people would say, people still say that today, or that, hey, you know, the disciples, these 12 fishermen came and fought off trained military Roman soldiers and took Jesus' body away. Mark had already heard that. And so when he writes his gospel, he wants to make sure, hey, this event is grounded in history. Like, I'm going to give you some details. I want you to know when it happened, where it happened, and who was there. And so he tells us, hey, these are the ladies that were there. They went on the first day of the week. They went at sunrise. He gives us these details. And not only that, but he includes some pretty interesting details that he could have easily left out. Like the next verse. Look at verse 3. They were saying to one another... Who will roll the stone away from the entrance to the tomb for us? You know why these women were asking that question? Because the men, the disciples, the guys who said, Jesus, we won't leave you. Where were they? They were hiding. They were afraid that the people who crucified Jesus were coming after them next. And so Mark, listen, this is so important, church. Mark includes this embarrassing detail that would have painted the disciples as cowards to their contemporaries. Now, when you're writing a story, why would you include a detail that's embarrassing on purpose? If I told you, I could, listen, I could very easily tell you that in the third grade, I fractured my nose standing up to a bully on the playground. The only reason that I would actually tell you that I fractured my nose because I slipped in the shower while I was trying to dance like Michael Jackson (laughs) is because that's the truth, all right? The only reason you willingly embarrass yourself is because you're just trying to tell the truth. Mark is saying, hey, this actually happened. Like these people, these disciples, man, they were cowards. And the only reason I'm telling you that is because that's what actually happened. He's trying to make sure that we understand he's telling the truth here. And that's important because the claim that he's about to make is so grand, he needs to make sure we know he's not making it up. Look at verse four. Looking up, they noticed that the stone, which was very large, large, had already been rolled away. When they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. 
Don't be alarmed, he told them. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. Look at the place where they put him, but go tell his disciples and Peter that he is going ahead of you to Galilee and you will see him there just as he told you. First question I want to put before you this morning, why did Jesus rise from the dead? I want to give you two reasons. Number one, he rose from the dead because he said he was going to. End of verse 7 says, he's already told you that this was going to happen and he would meet up with you in Galilee. And the reason we know he already said that is because if you flip back one page, Mark chapter 14, the night before Jesus was crucified, he's hanging out with his disciples and he says this, Mark 14 verse 28, then Jesus said to them, all of you will fall away because it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. Verse 28, but after I have risen, I will go ahead of you to Galilee. That is one of at least 14 verses in the gospel accounts where Jesus predicted his death and resurrection. 14 times. That alone is worth our attention, isn't it? Somebody to call their shot and pull it off? Like, man, one of the most iconic stories in all of sports is when Babe Ruth called a shot, right? 1932 World Series, Babe steps up to the plate, he points to deep center, sure enough, man, he hits a home run to the exact spot. That story is so iconic that you can go to any average sandlot and you're going to see some eight-year-old kid do the exact same thing at the plate almost a hundred years later. 14 times Jesus said, hey, I'm going to be crucified, but I'm going to rise again. The skeptic, listen, the skeptic can argue all day about Big Bang, evolution, science, old earth, new earth. We can argue all day about that stuff. But at the end of the day, the skeptic has to come to terms, has to come to the fork in the road and ask themselves, what if? What if a man predicted his own crucifixion and his resurrection and it happened? What if it's true? Because if it's true, listen, that's not just worth your attention, that's worth your life. Because the same man who claimed to die and rise again and pulled it off, he also claimed to be God. And he also claimed to be Lord. And he also claimed to be the way, the truth, and the life, and that no one gets to the Father except through him. Jesus rose from the dead because he said he would, church. And the God of this Bible always keeps his word. But I want to point out one other thing in verse 7. Mark chapter 16, verse 7. This is so good. The angel said, but go, tell his disciples and Peter. Now that's interesting. Because Peter was one of the disciples. So why does the angel, why does Jesus make the distinction to single Peter out? It's because of the last thing that Peter did before Jesus died. Do we remember? Peter denied any association to Jesus, not once, but three different times. What's the natural response to that? If somebody wrongs you, Hurts you, man. Like, what's the natural response? Anger? Frustration? Be like, you know what? I'm done with you, man. Jesus could have very easily said, hey, I want you to tell the disciples that I'll meet up, in, meet up with them in Galilee and you make sure Peter knows he can't come. But he didn't say that, did he? He said, no, 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 you tell the disciples and Peter. Don't forget to tell Peter. Make sure Peter knows that I'll see him in Galilee. Jesus wants to make sure that Peter knows his failure isn't going to keep him out of his family. And man, I am so glad. Aren't you so glad this morning, church, to know that your failures don't have to keep you out of God's family? 
Why is that the case? Why can Jesus say that for Peter's sake? It's because of the other reason for Jesus' resurrection. He didn't just rise because he said he was going to. He rose from the dead because he was dead. And the reason that he died is why? To save us from our sin. Save us from our failures. Every single person in this room and every single person outside of this room has sinned against God. And there is a just punishment for that. It's death. And I'm not just talking about physical death. I'm talking about death, death. I'm talking about you die and then you experience eternal separation and eternal wrath because of that sin. That's what we deserve. But Jesus came and lived a sinless life, meaning he didn't deserve death, but what did he do? He went to the cross anyway. He died in our place. That's called substitutionary sacrifice. God loved you so much, he sent his son to die on a cross, to forgive you of your sin. We've been, if you've been with us at at LifePoint for a little bit, we've been in the book of Hebrews for a little while, all right, since last fall. In fact, we're going to get back into it next week. But one of the passages that we read a few weeks ago, it talks about the priests of the Old Testament and how these priests would sacrifice lambs and goats and bulls in order to temporarily satisfy God's wrath for the sins of Israel. But they had to make those sacrifices all the time, didn't they? Over and over and over. Because, And here's why. Because an animal can't pay for your sin. But then it gets to the part about Jesus' sacrifice for the sins of the world. And here's what the writer of Hebrews says. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 26. But now Christ has appeared one time, one time at the end of the ages for the removal of sin by the sacrifice of himself. Jesus died for your sin. Here's the millionaire, million dollar question. You ready? If that's true, all right, it's one thing to make the claim that a man died for our sin and that God has put our punishment on this man. It's one thing to hear that claim, but how do we know that God has actually accepted Jesus' sacrifice for us? How can we be sure of that? It's like if you go to a store, all right, you, you buy something, you, you want to get something off the shelf, you go to the checkout count, counter, or better yet, the self-checkout counter nowadays, all right? Go to self-checkout, scan it, the screen pops up, and it says, here's the cost, right? You have incu- incurred a debt, This is what it cost. How do you get that debt to go away? You pay it. You swipe your card. You put the cash in. You pay it. Now, how do you know that the transaction went through? How do you know that the payment was paid? What do you get? A receipt. Anybody still keep their receipts? Yeah? No? A couple of you. All right. We have incurred a sin debt. And the payment for sin is death. And by all means, we can pay that debt. But it means eternal separation and eternal wrath from God. But Jesus came and what did he do? He paid that debt, didn't he? Jesus went to the cross. And the last thing Jesus said before he died was what? It is finished. You know what's interesting about that word? It's the Greek word tetelestai. You know where we see that word most often in first century like documents and artifacts that we found? We found that word stamped or written on loan documents because the word tetelestai also means paid in full. So when Jesus died on the cross, he was saying, it is finished. That payment, it's paid in full. It's done. The cross was the payment, but the receipt is the resurrection of Jesus. The receipt is God raising Jesus from the dead and saying, I accept that sacrifice for you. This is exactly what Paul says in Romans chapter 4. And I'm throwing a lot of scripture at you, but it's fine. All right, Romans chapter 4, verse 25. He, Jesus, was delivered up for our trespasses. He went to the cross for our sin, and he was raised for our justification. Justification, it means being made right with God. And what he's saying is that Jesus' resurrection was a necessary component of making you right with God. It had to happen. This is why he says, if if Jesus wasn't raised from the dead, we're still in our sin. But if he did, what does that mean for you? 
If Jesus did rise from the dead, if he was the son of God, if he lived a sinless life, if he died on the cross for your sin and he rose from the dead, what's it mean for you? It means that we get to live in the power of his resurrection. You and I, as followers of Jesus, get to live in the power of his resurrection. Now, what does that mean? It doesn't mean that we get to walk around all big and bad, thinking that we're like untouchable or that everything's going to go well for us and it's just all going to be roses and rainbows and butterflies for us as we follow Jesus. Paul tells us what the power of the resurrection is. And here's what he says, Philippians chapter three. My goal is to know him and the power of his resurrection. Here it is. And the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death, assuming that I will somehow reach the resurrection from the dead. He's saying being a Christian doesn't mean that life's always gonna go well for you. It doesn't mean that you're always gonna be healthy and wealthy and prosperous despite what some people will try to tell you. He says, hey, you're gonna endure suffering. You're gonna face death. The same writer Paul also says in Romans chapter 5, guess what? We get to rejoice in our sufferings. What kind of person rejoices in suffering? What kind of person rejoices as they sit in a chair and endure chemo treatment? What kind of person can experience the loss of a child and rejoice? kind of person can experience the loss of a loved one, experience sickness, experience, and face even death and rejoice. It's the kind of people that understand this. Colossians chapter 1 verse 18. Jesus is also the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead so that he might come to have first place in everything. That word firstborn is very important. You know what it means? Firstborn means first. I'm the firstborn son in my family. I was first. But it it also means not the last. Jesus was the firstborn to rise from the dead. He was the first to rise from the dead, but he ain't gonna be the last. Who's next? Who's next? Us. It's the church. That Jesus rose from the dead so that you will rise from the dead. Paul says that the power of the resurrection is coming face to face with suffering and staring death down the barrel and understanding that it has no power over you because Jesus has already conquered death. And that when he returns, we're going to be resurrected to new life. God took the thing that brings us the most fear Every anxiety and every worry in your life is rooted in your fear of death. And God took that fear and he crushed it through the death and the resurrection of Jesus. Jesus rose again and he turns to his church and he says, you're next. Man, think about that for a moment. How does that change the way you live? Honestly, do you understand? Do you understand? If you are in Christ, you're never going to die. Sure, your heart may stop beating and you may breathe your last breath, but it ain't the end. And on the other side of that is eternal life. And one day when Jesus returns, he's going to give us new bodies that are even better than these, a body that will never fail you. A mind that's always going to be sharp. A body that will never get sick and never hurt, never be in pain. He's going to give you that body so that you can live with him forever in a new heaven and a new earth and experience nothing but joy and happiness. Do you understand that? Because if you understand that, it should change the way that you live. What a thing that we have to look forward to. Um, have you seen these, uh, 
Ninja Creamy Things. You seen this? This ad? Anybody? No? Okay. It's like, a, um, <clears throat> it's like an ice cream maker, right? Except you can literally put anything in it, and it'll turn it into ice cream. As long as you freeze it, you put it in that thing, it turns into ice cream. Now, <clears throat> we have uh, somebody on our staff who's just, you know, is trying to lose a little bit of weight. I'm not going to put him on blast, say his name, Blake. But <clears throat> anyway, <laughs> Blake's, you know, he's died in a little bit. He's trying to get into shape. He's trying to take care of himself. And he got one of these Ninja Creamies. And here's the thing, man. I have, see, I have watched Blake endure some, some pain, all right? Because as the, the loving staff that we are, what we like to do is we like to give him, put candy and stuff on his desk and, you know, like try to throw off his diet, you know. I've watched him refuse. Shut up. We love each other. All right. <clears throat> it's all in good fun. I've watched him refuse that. I've watched him suffer and endure through diet, through food that he doesn't really want to eat. I've watched him eat, you know, hey, he's got really good food, Right? And he enjoys that food. You know why he can endure the hard parts of that diet and the good parts of the diet? It's because no matter what happens, he's still got ice cream coming that night. And it's good ice cream because he could go and get one of those like Fairlife protein shakes, a chocolate milk. It's got like two grams of fat, two grams of sugar, 30 grams of protein. And he can put that in there and it tastes just like chocolate ice cream, but it's actually good for him. He has that to look forward to every single day. Church, do you understand what you have to look forward to? Do you understand what is awaiting us? And we have eternity at our doorstep. And that changes the way that you live. It means that the good things that you go through, man, what, how much more joy should we have in the good things because we know what's awaiting us and yet God still chooses to give us good things right here. Man, as Christians, we should enjoy the good gifts of God more than anybody. But it also means that when you go through hard crap, it doesn't have to crush you. It's not the end. And that suffering that you're going through, it seems eternal in the moment, doesn't it? It seems like it's never going to end. It's a dark tunnel with no exit. That's what it feels like. But I'm telling you, in the grand scheme of eternity, it is so short. And the reward is so close. That is something that changes how we endure this life. That's what it means to live in the power of Christ's resurrection. To know that we can stare down the barrel of the hardest that this life has to throw at us and know that we will not lose because Jesus is victorious. We started this morning by saying that the resurrection is the foundation of Christianity. If the resurrection didn't happen, man, we are in trouble. But if it is, I want to be clear. Listen, if the resurrection of Jesus Christ is true, I want you to understand you can be in here, not be a Christian, and you can build a good life. You can have a great family, great kids, you can have lots of nice things have a great career, have financial security, like you can build a great life, you can be a great person. But if you don't get this right, it is eternally fatal. And I just believe that God has brought you here this morning so that you can hear the good news that Jesus died for your sin, that he rose again to new life, and he is offering you salvation and eternity as a gift gift, a gift, not something you got to work for, not something you got to earn. Romans chapter 3, verse 23, for all have sinned, every single one of us have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That's the bad news, but the good news, they are justified freely. What's that word mean? What's freely mean? It means free, free. 
by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Our acceptance into the family of God is not based on our performance. It is based on who we put our trust in. That is a beautiful gift. And the thing that you can do with gifts, you really got two options. If somebody gives you a gift, you can reject it. Or you can receive it and say thank you. God is giving you an opportunity. Maybe you're in here this morning and you have never put your faith and trust in Jesus. And he's given you an opportunity this morning. You have heard the good news. And he's letting you know that you can receive it free. That you believe in Jesus and what he has done for you and you seek to follow him from here on out. So here's what we're going to do. The band's going to come out and sing. And I just, I want to take this opportunity that we have, this last song on Easter Sunday, 2024. And I want us to just wring ourselves dry this morning. Listen, I know you got stuff to do. You got family dinners and lunch and all that stuff to get to, and that's great. But can we wring ourselves dry this morning, church, and give our risen king, who has done all the work for us, can we give him the worship that he deserves this morning? And if you need help trying to get to that place, listen, let me just share with you that something that happened this week. We were in here on Friday night, Good Friday And we were singing just some good old hymns, right? I don't know about you, everybody has a different story, but I grew up in a small little backwoods kind of Baptist church where we sang those songs. It's probably been 20 years since I sang those songs that we sang on Friday night. And I'm telling you, man, I was wrecked on Friday. I was standing, I was right there singing these songs that I hadn't heard, hadn't sung in 20 years, and it was calling to mind. on to mind the home that I grew up in and the church that I grew up in and the people that were so faithful I mean, they love God and they love me and they were so faithful just to tell me the gospel and I had this thought man what a beautiful thought that God has not only accomplished all the means of our salvation he's done all the work but he has also orchestrated every single event in your life to lead to your salvation. What a good God that is. And so in a moment, I'm gonna pray for us and I just want us to sit. I want us to sit for just like 30 seconds. And I want you to think back and see if you can trace the footsteps, the the good footsteps of God's grace and sovereignty in your life that have led to you actually knowing that you are in the family of God. Because I'm telling you, man, if you can think back on that for just a minute, I'm sure it'll break you. I'm sure that it will show you just how gracious God is. And if that can't get you to worship him, I don't know what else will. Maybe you're in here and you can't trace those steps. Maybe you can't think of that time where you put your faith and trust in Jesus. And I want to tell you this morning, today, my friend, today is that day. God has given you the gift of breath in your lungs and he has given you the gift of being able to walk into this church so that you can hear about the ultimate gift that he wants to offer you and it's salvation. And he does not want you to leave here empty handed. The God of the universe is offering everything. Everything. Don't walk out of here empty handed. Father God, I'm 
I'm broken. By your grace and mercy. But my heart is bursting with joy, gratitude. I know I probably look like a fool up here, 30 year old man, just bawling my eyes out right now, Lord, but I don't care. How you have done so many good things for me, not the least of which is dying for my sin, coming back to life. God, I praise you for that. And I pray that every single person in this room would be able to share that same testimony this morning. In Christ's name, amen. I'm a prisoner no more. I shame was a ransom for the Cancel my debt and he called me his friend.
thank you guys. Thank you guys for being here this morning. Real quick, listen, if you have made a choice to believe in Jesus this morning, I just want to encourage you. Listen, this life following Jesus is not meant to be done alone. That's where we're saved into the church. And man, we want to come alongside you and walk with Jesus together. We want to study God's word. And maybe you're thinking, hey, I don't even understand how to read it. That's what the church is for. And we help each other with this. And so if you've made that choice and you want to talk to somebody about that today or talk about how to get plugged in, talk about your next step from here, I'd love to have a conversation with you before you leave. Uh, Please see me either down here or over in the Connect Center. Other than that, man, love you guys so much. Happy Resurrection Sunday, and may go in the power of the resurrection today. All right, love you guys. to the Lord above petitions brought before the God of love great high priest let us hold fast near your throne of grace bring us in your midst great high priest paid for our past Near your throne of grace, bring us in your midst. Your blood shed for all our faults. Your flesh broken for the dead. Your pain restoring what was lost. Your life, a passage lined with red, sympathizing with our weakness, tempted, tried our perfect lamb, our humble praises to the great I am. Purchased by his love, in his presence we now stand. Our Redeemer entered in for us, no more blood of bulls or lambs. Freedom purchased by his love, in his presence we now stand. 